You got it? All okay. right. You're good to go. Well, we've already enjoyed a Class B miracle uh, on Sunday morning here. <laughs> um, anyway, we are going to continue our study in the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter one, and uh, in this particular book is where God's transcendent truth collides with his personal love. And uh, this uh, section of scripture itself is so high and so lofty that it's just difficult to get our arms around it. Uh, we're told that we've been elected and adopted and redeemed and forgiven and are eternally secure because of the fact that we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And each action of God is just freighted with implications that uh, communicate just how special we are to our Heavenly Father. And what I want to do, last week I concentrated on the word election, and uh, this week we're going to single out the doctrine of adoption. And uh, the few verses that are germane to what I want to say today are verses 3 to 6, and I'm going to just read them for you as we begin today. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, to himself according to the kind intention of his will. And uh, our adoption in Christ really flows out of the river of God's elective love. And what I wanna do today is define adoption and then look at a couple of the benefits of it and uh, see if we can't uh, embrace this word in a way that uh, really reflects our love for the Lord and his love for us. So let's define adoption, what is it? Well, the Greek word for adoption means to make you a son, make you a daughter. That's kind of the English word as well. In the Roman Empire, it's really interesting because adoption actually meant bringing an adult into your family. And the scenario went something like this. A man has an estate, but no heir. And he doesn't want his estate broken up when he's gone. And so what he does is he adopts a like-minded man with the same values and the same goals. And a couple of things occur. First, the new son's obligations are canceled and his debts are covered by his new father. Second, he takes on the name of his new father and, begin, and becomes the heir of the family estate. So adoption is one of a, a number of different metaphors early on in the gospel of, uh, in the book, I should say, of Ephesians that describe an aspect of the greatness of our salvation. Just let me tick through a few of them. In justification, which is a terrific word, it means that God removes all of our guilt and then declares us righteous. In redemption, God delivers us from bondage and purchases our freedom. In forgiveness, God pays our moral debt and grants us a pardon. In reconciliation, God removes our hostility and makes us a friend. In adoption, God moves us from being a stranger to being a son or a daughter. You know, it is one thing to be declared righteous or to purchase freedom or to grant a pardon or make you a friend, but it's an altogether different thing for God to bring you into his family give you his name, and make you an heir of his wealth. Adoption is the most intimate of all of these wonderful metaphors, and it's because it speaks of sonship or daughtership. Now, I'm going to limit my words today to sonship uh, just to avoid clumsiness, but it includes both genders. Our sonship in God's family is like and unlike Christ's sonship. 
Uh, it's safe to assume that uh, those of you who have adoptive children and biological children would treat them all as equally valuable. Love, attention, money, resources, affection flow to them all. And God does the same thing with his adoptive children. In John chapter 17 and verse 23, Jesus says that the Father loves you even as he loves the Son. In other words, the Father's love for you is not diminished in any degree uh, than his love for his only begotten Son. And here's the reason for it. It's because we carry the righteousness of the Son. And again, I, I bring you back to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ when he died uh, on our behalf. And it was his death where God took our sin and put it on him, imputed it to, our, to the Son of God on the cross, and he died for that sin. But his death for our sin is still not sufficient to merit us a ticket to heaven. Uh, he also did something else. The God the Father took the righteousness, the perfect life of Jesus, and imputed it to us. So that when he looks at us, he sees Jesus. And it's this double transaction that merits us our salvation. And what a great salvation it is. You know, sometimes uh, in the past, all of us have been upset sometimes because we've missed out on some form of re recognition or honor uh, that uh, we feel that we deserved. And uh, sometimes we remember it and stew over it a little bit and so forth. But that's a sure fire, sig fire signal that uh, we're forgetting the even as love of God the Father. God honors you, not sort of like, but even as the only begotten Son. And in that sense, our sonship is like Jesus' sonship. But in another respect, our sonship is unlike Jesus' sonship, and we understand that. You see, when Jesus talks about the Father, in relation to himself, he calls the Father, my Father. When Jesus talks about the Father in relation to his disciples, he called him, your Father. But Jesus never lumps himself together with his disciples and refers to God as our Father. We're adopted into his family, but we don't merge into the Godhead. We obey God. We don't become God. So our sonship is both like and unlike Jesus' sonship. So that's my first point. Point number one, adoption is bringing you into God's family. Now, what are the benefits of being an adoptive son or daughter? And a benefit is something that promotes your well-being. The value of a position in a company, for instance, is in part determined by the benefit package. Health insurance, paid vacations, uh, perhaps a retirement program and so forth. Now what's the benefit package that we have as God's child? Let me highlight two of them for you. First benefit is you get a family. Now those of you who have adopted children have done so at considerable cost. And this would especially be true if you've gone through a private agency. When God filed papers to bring you and me into his family, he did so at a great cost. And it can't be calculated financially because it cost him the blood of his dear son. He loves you. God loves you more than you could possibly even love yourself. Now, there is such a thing as the fatherhood of God by virtue of creation, and I think we understand that. But it can't compare to calling God Father by virtue of relation. You see, when you come into his presence, you get his immediate 
loving attention and he can do it with the masses at the same time. That's our, our powerful God. You know, parents, you who are parents, when your children come into your presence and they're hurting, what do they need to do in order to melt your heart? Maybe give you a notarized list of all of the good things that you've done, this, that they've done this past month. You know, all they really need to say is dad and mom through their own sadness, and you're there. You're all over it. And when you say father to the God of heaven, you can take your readiness and your availability for your children and multiply it by a million. And you won't come close to the attention that the God of the universe gives to you. He's always ready to pour out benevolence. I mean, think about how the Bible tells us to pray. You know, the Bible says, keep asking, keep knocking, be fervent. And we ask the question, why? Why do we have to be fervent? Why can't we just deliver the request and move on? And it's simply because God the Father is our dad. And fervent prayer makes absolutely no sense apart from family. We're kids continually tugging on the coat sleeve of dad. And dads like the repetition. Our heavenly father, our heavenly dad likes the repetition. And so we keep on asking, knowing that he's going to give us good gifts at just the right time. He'll withhold that which we think is good, but he knows is not good. And it's not good either because it's bad or because it's good, but at this particular time, it may not draw you closer to him. Let me give you a second benefit. You get an inheritance. Now in Ephesians, if you've got your Bible open, drop down to verse 18, chapter one, verse 18. Uh, I pray, says the apostle Paul, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And the inheritance really runs both directions. He is our inheritance, and we are actually his inheritance as well. Now, I briefly want to look at each one of those. You know, back in verse 14, it says that we are God's own possession. And the word possession means portion. And one's portion is his wealth. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 9 says that the Lord's portion is his people. And that simply means when the Lord looks at you, he feels wealthy. And the older I get, the more that I understand that. You know, Suzanne and I have been married uh, 48 years and a few months from now. And if you, in case you're wondering, both of us were three when we got married to each other. But I, uh, I have one wife, I have four sons, I have three daughters-in-law, I have seven grandchildren. And last Christmas, I had them all together in our living room. And I thought, you know, Gary, you're not a man of wealth but you're indescribably rich. And that is exactly how God looks at you, only multiplied by just about infinity. You are a precious jewel in his eyes. You know, when the high priest uh, in the Old Testament went into the Holy of Holies, and you may recall that there was a temple that was uh, built by Moses during the wanderings, uh, not a temple, but a kind of a tent that was carried out uh, during the wanderings uh, to the promised land led by Moses. And there were two parts uh, to the tent. Uh, one was the holy place and the other was the holy of holies. And the priest could go into the holy place, but only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. And he did it one time a year. And uh, when he went into uh, the Holy of Holies, he had to wear a, a particular 
uh, little vest uh, with 14 or with 12 jewels uh, on the vest itself. And it was simply uh, a testimony to the 12 tribes of Israel uh, that, uh, that he went in and represented. And now picture Jesus as he approaches the Father. And he doesn't come empty handed. What he does is he brings you with him. And you are a precious jewel over the heart of Jesus Christ. And when the Father looks at you, he sees absolute beauty and moral glory. You know, all the self-actualization in the world won't do as much for your soul as the realization that when God looks at you, he feels wealthy. And when that sinks in, we no longer need to go through life looking for strokes. You know, it's, ir it's ironic that uh, people reject Christianity because they think it's too narrow. It's too confining. It makes you feel too bad about yourself. And the love of God, my dear friends, is so lofty that the only legitimate reason for rejecting it is because it makes you feel too good about yourself. We are his inheritance, and we also have a glorious inheritance in him. And Romans chapter 8 reminds <clears throat> us that creation groans, yearning for the liberty of the sons of God. And we groan as well, waiting for our full and final adoption to be realized. And when that happens, we'll lose our flaws and we'll gain his integrity, his wisdom, and his greatness. And the universe itself is standing, if you'll allow me to personify it, standing on its tiptoes, eagerly awaiting for our glorious translation, tr translation as children of the King. Now, the eternal life component of Christianity is... Uh, often de-emphasized today, uh, even by the, the, the spiritual people. And I think it's to our detriment. You know, we want a faith that's valuable here and now. We want a practical Christianity that helps us form sound marriages, raise good children, and form positive friendships. We want a faith that will cure our loneliness and take away our fits of anger and show us how to deal with discouragements. Now, those are all good things, but they need to be balanced with the anticipation of Christ's future return. And it's the basis of our hope, and it's in that light of his coming that we live. And it helps us separate that which is permanent from that which is passing. Because everything that's not permanent, the Bible treats as insubstantial. And that's why the Bible can seem so irritatingly out of touch with reality once in a while. It just brushes past huge philosophical problems and personal anger, uh, agony. And we scream, hey, stop. That's where I live. I, I need to hear more. And God says, you know what? You'll never be free from the sting of loneliness and the sting of sorrow. You know, we need to remember that Christ in us is our strength. And the body of Christ with you is our comfort. Now, amid the mess of our lives, amid the broken experiments and the mistaken theories, amid the joys and the sorrows, is a vein of pure gold. And sometimes it services, and sometimes it simply lies buried. But it will be purified with fire. And when that furious burning is over, we'll look at the shining gold and say, God, you were there all the time. You see, it's the unfulfillments of this life that keep us looking to the future. That's not escapism, that's reality. And our future foundation for living, it's our future foundation for living faithfully. We are his adopted children. And with that comes a meaningful present, albeit painful at times, and a glorious future that we can look forward to. Uh, just by way of, I want to say a few words by way of conclusion. 
you know, what does God want in return for the blessing of adoption that he has poured out on us? Well, he wants the same thing that your mom wants on Mother's Day, which is next week, by the way. Uh, he wants the same thing that your dad wants on Father's Day, which is a month away. You know, they simply want to be remembered. You know, a long time ago, back in the 1940s, there was a movie that was starring Olivia de Havilland called To Each His Own. Uh, it wasn't in color, obviously. It was in black and white. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the story. During World War I, a woman meets a pilot, a pilot in World War I back in the 1920s, and they fall passionately in love with one another and uh, went for too far, and she winds up being pregnant. And he leaves, goes back to the, to the fighting lines and is killed in battle. And she leaves town during that pregnancy in order to give birth to a baby boy. Because in those days, there was a huge public shame about having a child out of wedlock. And she wanted to avoid the stigma that her child would suffer. And so she devises a scheme where she plants the child on the front porch of her good friend, knowing that her friend would not want to raise the child, and she would volunteer to raise the child herself. And the plan has an unexpected twist, however, because the little boy is actually adopted by her friends and is now legally hers. And Olivia de Havilland in the movie is just brokenhearted. And she's in this weird situation of doing nice things for her little boy who grows up near her. She loves him from afar and sacrifices for him. But the boy never knows that she is his birthing mother. At the end of the movie, the boy is a soldier. He's a spitting image of his father killed t two decades earlier, but he was now in World War II. And he had a wonderful girlfriend and they planned on getting married. And Olivia de Havilland arranges for the wedding. And at the reception itself, an older gentleman and friend of Olivia's comes up to the young man and says, can't you put all of this together? Don't you realize who this woman is? Think through all the ways that she has sacrificially loved you her whole life. All she ever hoped for is that you would be happy, even though you'd never know. And the soldier put it all together. In the very last scene, when everybody was dancing, the son walks over to Olivia and he says, Mother, can I have this dance? And he remembered and he gave her the credit. He says, now I see who you are and what you've done for me. And again, it is Mother's Day next week. And uh, dads, I've teed it up for you. And the nicest thing that you children can say to your mother is to remember her by saying thanks. And the nicest thing that you can say to your father next month is to remember him by simply saying thanks for what you've done, most of which you probably don't even know. And here's the point. The nicest thing you and I can say to the God of glory who has adopted us into his family is to regularly say thanks. Our Father, we thank you uh, for the attention you give to us. Even when our minds are far away, uh, you never ditch us. You don't scold us. You're so gentle. Your spirit uh, is so comforting to us. And we traverse our way through this life 
oftentimes ignoring you, but knowing that we shouldn't. And when we go back, we sometimes uh, go back and knowing that, uh, thinking that you might have a frown, but you never do. It's always a smile. You always welcome us into your presence. We are your adopted children and the price you paid in order to bring us into your family is beyond our own calculation. We know nothing personally about that kind of love. We only can read about it in you and believe it and somehow hope that in the time in the future that we will truly understand just how precious we are to you, even when we don't feel like we are to anybody else. And Lord, we thank you that um, you continue uh, to, to pour out all of your blessings and all of your love upon us. And we just, uh, we thank you for it to during this time. We think of the fact that we've been elected and brought into your family. And then all of those wonderful words of justification and redemption and so forth that just describe different ways that you love us and treat us and how you've looked upon us. And so for that, Lord, uh, on this uh, beautiful spring day, we just say thanks. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the, the cross and what you've done. And the Lord, uh, even that's not sufficient, but you take delight when your children just look up. And uh, that we are doing. Bless Harvest Church, bless the individuals in it. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.